Yeah, right. <laughs> At least we can do this. And you're live. Okay. Hey, welcome everyone who's tuned in for today's interview. And we're doing this one a little bit earlier in the day for you in the U.S. who are wondering why. Because right now, uh, parts of Europe are experiencing another shutdown. And this is European timing. And today, we have Mr. Hanamantra, uh, who's beaming in from the U.K. And... Uh, I've been, you know, noticing and following his work for a long time. Uh, um, you may be familiar with Joe Harrison, his partner in, uh, uh, in both parenting and in their studio, Unity. Uh, Hannah Mantra, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, just a capsule of uh, where you're at in the tattoo world right now, and then we can start going into a little bit of history and stuff. Yeah, well, it, I mean... Right now, like you say, we're in lockdown. So, from a tattoo side of things, it's kind of we're a, uh, yeah, we're we're on a kind of a go slow with the ta with the tattooing. But um, but you know, with, with the uh, with this being back in lockdown and, and unable to tattoo, it's kind of nice because in in the last lockdown, we really got a chance to, you know, both Joe and I, and I know for a lot of people who uh, who tattoo or who are in the creative industry, they got time to really focus on work that maybe uh, they. It constantly gets put to the back burner because you've got other other priorities that, that take over uh, so yeah so at the minute you know we're just getting to spend time working away from the skin uh, working either digitally on canvas on paper i've got a lot of projects that i'm that i'm working on daily now that have taken the place of tattooing and uh, i'm looking forward to to sharing more of that as the as the as the weeks go by so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about your personal history. First of all, uh, I just wanted to ask you about the, your, your chosen name, Hana Mantra. This is referring to the Hindu god Hanuman, who, you know, the mountain mover. Uh, I want to tell us a little bit about that reference and why you yeah. chose it for yourself. Yeah, um, there were several, several reasons why I didn't want to kind of tattoo with my, with my name. Um, and so I decided I wanted to, to have a, a name that kind of uh, represented what it was I was trying to achieve with tattooing. You know, I've, I've always created tattoos that have a very kind of strong, bold aesthetic. And, and I, I wanted them to, to have a feeling of, of protection for the wearer, uh, you know, kind of like uh, armor worn under the skin. Now, in Thailand, I spent a lot of time training out in Thailand. Uh, I used to compete a lot in a kind of kickboxing and Muay Thai, martial arts. And, um, and over there, the Hanuman is very often tattooed, very often on the chest of the Thai fighters, and he's tattooed there as a, for, for protection. And in Thailand, you can see a lot of, uh, a lot of the belief system around tattoos where you know, people genuinely believe that you know they have a lot of amulets and, and a tattoo is like a skin amulet they believe in the in the power that that the ink represents so i i love that i love the imagery and i love the kind of symbology of what a hanuman was with that with that kind of protective element uh, which is what i wanted to produce with my work have people feeling like that um and then the, the mantras and then i spliced the two as together and i didn't want to take that name exactly hanuman, a mantra was just something that that as long as I can remember, I've kind of used it. I've used a mantra, whether it's to, you know, whether it was when I was training and to to push through through the sessions or through the, the you know the kind of the, the tough the tough times. Uh, and same now, you know, with life, if, if there's times when I feel overwhelmed, underwhelmed, um, you know, overly inspired or not inspired, you know, I, I usually have like a, a mantra that I can run through my mind and kind of bring back a level of balance. Uh, so again, it was just something that was that was important to me, and that I felt could could better represent what it was what I was trying to create with a tattoo. Nice, nice. You know, I I figured mantra had something to do with with a uh, you know a, almost a devotional way of thinking, right? Um, yeah. And whether it be towards your your craft, I mean, while you're in the middle of a tattoo session, I definitely find myself in this place too where especially hours into it and you're dealing with the person's pain you're dealing with your own you know possible fatigue and discomfort although you're still enjoying yourself right but uh there definitely is this 
this place where you're putting one foot in front of the other and, and, and keeping it moving. And uh, it's, it's interesting how you've incorporated that into your name. Um, so uh, I'm gonna ask you just a couple of very basic questions. Uh, uh, how long you've been tattooing? Where did you learn? And I always like to hear about people's apprenticeship or lack of. Yeah, so I guess, so the, the, the I, I feel like I didn't like I didn't have a, a kind of a very formal apprenticeship, um, but you know I've been with Joe. I mean we we've been together I think uh, maybe twelve years or so now, um, and uh, I hope I got that right. <laughs> and um, and 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 she was a huge kind of uh, a pivotal moment for me and and tattooing and, and really kind of showed me. I, I mean, to be honest with you, it's funny. It, tattooing is a, is a, it's a practical thing. We do it with our hands. So you can only ever really learn by doing. You can only really learn it for yourself. And and I feel like certainly earlier on in people's careers, that that seems to be such a, a focal point as like, you know, uh, how do you do this? What, what ink you using? What needs you? You know, all these things that, and they're, they're the kind of, they're really the least important thing. I feel like what Joe really helped me see and, and, and evolved my my kind of approach to tattooing uh, the the parts of tattooing that aren't the this you know do this like this do this like this set this up like this uh, she showed me that what I would consider the more important aspects of tattooing you know be, being in service of of the person you're tattooing um, you know approaching it with with respect and, and you know with respect and prioritizing your client over yourself really um you know she was really instrumental in that and again i can't i can't emphasize enough how, how i feel like that for me is the more important aspect than than how i tattoo you know honestly i tattoo probably the same as 80 percent of the people out there who tattoo you know we kind of all do the same things to a degree uh, there's very minor variations where there is huge variations uh, though and i do you know there is massive variations is is how people approach it um what their intentions are, the level of kind of respect they have for the people who are handing over their skin. I see huge variations in that. And, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of people and I guess it's kind of like fulfilling their ego with their tattooing. Um, and again, I'm not saying I've been immune to that or, or whatnot, but it's definitely something that I I feel like I'm a lot more in tune with with kind of with providing what my clients want from me, as opposed to doing what I want to do. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. If oh I'm yeah, absolutely. It's being clear, uh, you know. It's an easy trap to fall into, especially once you start to develop a, a name uh, where you stop remembering that relationship and you start thinking of yourself as being this artistic force. And let's just say that you are in part an artistic force. I mean, we all are. Uh, but every tattoo is a collaboration and the act of tattooing is a partnership. And, um, you know, just on a pure practical level, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to the studio here because I get people here who are serious collectors. They've been to a lot of big names and I'll look at their collection and I'll point something out and say, man, that's a really rad piece. And I'll say, yeah, he was a dick. Yeah, right. first thing that comes out of their mouth. Yep. They don't even want to say, thanks, man. Yeah, I love it. Uh, because they yep. don't, because they got a dose of bad energy when they got the piece. And it doesn't matter that it's masterfully done. And I think that the person right. doing it might forget that, that uh, really at the end of the day, uh, this, this might sound, you know, a little sappy, but uh, our job is beyond doing tattoos. Our job is to make people feel good about themselves. That is why we, that's why they pay us. Right, yep. we should honor that. I th you know, I'm with you 100 percent there, and it, that is one of the things that I try and you know I talk to people and they ask about different things. One of the things I'd really try and emphasize, particularly to younger tattooers, or is the amount of the amount of objectively really good tattoos I've covered up. Um, you know, as in that they are technically executed well. They're done, like you say, by a person who's well established, or this, that, or the other, and they want shot of it now. I never question it personally because it's not my place to do that, whether they've outgrown it, whether it was, it was a bad experience, whatever. Like, as far as I'm concerned, as soon as the tag is finished, that you sign off and it belongs to that person so they can do what they want with it then. 
Um, you know, but and again, it's not sometimes it's not anything personal. Sometimes it's just they feel like they've they've evolved or their tastes have changed. But for sure, I've covered really good tattoos that that they were just like, yeah, the guy's a dick, or you know, she was looking this that like, the other, and and they it, they they harbor that feeling and that that energy with it, and it and after that, it's they for me like you fail as a tattooer at that point. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, it's uh, what good is it if you're creating something that basically makes someone feel worse about themselves? Uh, and I'm sure yeah, you've I, met I plenty of people. Time. I'm sure you've met plenty of people who have tattoos that aren't really anything special, but they just love the piece because yeah, absolutely. it was done right for the right reasons. The person put their heart and soul into it uh, and honored them, you know, listened yeah. to them, gave them the tattoo they wanted to the best of their ability and let them know that it was important that they got that, that they were there for them. And, uh, you know, you don't have to go over the top with this stuff. You don't have to lay it on too thick, but people know the difference. They're not dumb. Yeah. I think that yeah. as tattooers, we, we can be a little spoiled because, you know, I think about my own collection and there were a few like very, in the very early days when I was, you know, very young, when I had what was more like everybody's tattoo experience where I was just this young kid getting a tattoo. But mostly the tattoos I've exchanged with others, they've been acts of friendship and, and uh, you know, community because, you know, I'm embedded in this industry and, and the artists that come through here, we tattoo each other and it's, it's not the experience that collectors have when they come to us. We, we need to, to check ourselves every once in a while. So it's not just the pain of going through the tattoo. There's this additional level of you're nervous. You don't know how, what this person is going to be like who's about to work on you, do this life-changing thing to you. And maybe you've even been disrespected in the past and, and you're, you're carrying a little bit of that and you're, you're worrying about it. So uh, it, it's easy to forget that. And I try to remind myself because I know I don't do this every time. Uh, especially like I, I had a client recently who was very nervous and I could tell he was a little awkward about it at first and, and he wanted to, to really do a lot more numbing than people normally do or that I would even recommend. But I let him know, listen, I, I respect that. It's all good. Mm. And, uh, and you could see it's... Yeah. You know, and it made the rest of our conversation so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It, so when I tattoo with people, I generally... So everything I do, I draw on, and um, and for larger work, there's a it's a standard like to start larger work with me. It's two days, so I do a day of drawing, and then a, the following day we commit the lines to the skin. So that's it's just how I do it. I don't I don't deviate from that, and um, and I can see sometimes I get people in there, they're very like I say they've got that kind of nervous energy when they come into the studio at first and. And, you know, the first half an hour is, is me kind of just going, like reassuring them, really. I mean, I do it, you know, for their benefit. I, I you know, try and, you know, comfort them. I mean, they know what they're going to get to a degree because they're aware of my work and that's why they're there. And I'm very kind of upfront with how I, how I do my work and, and my approach to it. Um, but still, I feel like there's that, there's almost that smoothing, that tran smoothing transition to the point where you can finally see like, and, and I feel it's almost like, Oh, it's okay. He knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? Like I get so far through, and then they're like, "Okay, I can. See, I, I see now. He kind of knows what he, where he's going with this." And uh, yeah, and like what you see, you, you get that moment where it's like, "Okay," and it relax. And then the, the the whole dynamic changes, um, you know, and it, it kind of it, it makes for smoother seas. Then, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, no matter how good your reputation is, you still every every single person you're gonna have to earn that comfortable sense of trust you know yeah now there's professional trust but then there's that sense of actually getting comfortable like uh i know that when i sit down with this person i'm not going to have to um make those subtle hints and hope they don't get offended or any of that shit right yeah i can just sit down with that full confidence and i know i'm going to have a great experience get the tattoo yeah. i want yeah so uh, um oh, go ahead sorry what you I was just going to touch back on something you said before as well, you know, when, when you said about um, kind of, you know, reassuring people and, um, and you know, not having to go over the top with it. Uh, and, I, and I think that's also really important is not, you know, like kind of 
knowing I guess knowing who you are and being authentic to that and and not trying to front and and pretend you know pretend to be someone you know because again you know I really concentrate and put a lot of focus on my clients and provide an experience for them and uh, you know and being attentive and understanding what it is they they kind of they want from me and how I can best deliver that that being said I'm also not you know I, I'm not someone that's just going to I'm not a pushover with stuff either you know I feel like I've I've earned my I've earned my stripes and I've you know and I'm at a point where I kind of I know what I'm doing and I understand this and so I won't get pushed around either do you know what I mean there's like there's that fine balance with it of you know you sometimes you get people and they're very kind of timid and you need to kind of nurture them and make them feel comfortable and then other on the other end of the spectrum you get someone that's like you know bullish and comes in and and and, and they you know, and then it's a different approach. You know, you can't just sit back and, and kind of let someone, or, or at least for me anyway, I can't have someone coming in and trying to micromanage everything I'm doing and do it like, no, that's not how this works either. You know, I feel like it goes both ways. And I think having an understanding of yourself and and what you're willing to kind of put up with and what you're not it, with your tattoo process is important. Um, so yeah, I just, yeah. You know, I, I don't have to do this often. Um, in fact, I've never really had to implement it at all, but I, I've had to drop this hint a few times, only a few. Um, it's almost like with young children, you have to let people know where the limits are. Otherwise, I think it makes them more comfortable to know where the limits are, right? And, uh, and maybe they've seen TV shows where clients micromanage their artists or whatever, and, and they think, okay, I guess that's how it's done. But... Uh, you know, when I sense that coming on, I try to just say, okay, let's have a really thorough consultation. Make sure you tell me everything that you need to tell me because I'm gonna have a picture in my head by the end of that conversation. And we can't always just change this or change that because sometimes when you've got a complete picture, it's holistic. You can't just change one thing. The entire balance of it is altered as a result. So, uh, you know, I'm not a computer, I'm, uh, I'm an artist. And if I've got a good picture in my head and I start trying to develop it, you start throwing me curveballs that don't match that first conversation, then, um, you know, that, that's making me work twice as hard. So there's a fair amount of drawing and time and effort that I think is included with a large tattoo. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with hours and hours and hours of preparation. But there's been a couple of times I've had to let people know, hey, listen, the first round of drawings that I do for this are included in the price of the tattoo. But when we get on to the second round, it's half my tattooing hourly rate. Mm. And yeah. uh, I've never actually had to implement that, but sometimes you just have to say it, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the, the other thing about the micromanaging is, of course, you know, we, we sometimes have to say, hey, you know, you, you like my work, right? You know? Uh, I just want you to know that the work I do on you is going to look at least as good as anything you've seen me do in, um, yeah. in you know, and uh, you're going to have to trust me. There's yeah. going to be some steps from between here and there where it doesn't look as good as the finished stuff on Insta and you're just going to have to trust me. Uh, yeah. But fortunately, I don't think I get a lot of that either, but I do, I do know artists that have to put up with that crap. Uh, um, I'm very blessed. The kind of people that I tattoo, I, I can't complain about any of them, you know, yeah. Uh, so I, I know I'm not getting the realistic picture of what it's like for some people. Um, yeah. I mean, my wife has put up with that a little bit. Michelle, she's, she's just had more micromanaging kind of clients uh, than, than I have by far. And it can go one of two ways. The consultation gets to a point where we part ways or they come around and turn out to be amazing clients. Yeah. And you, you needed to get past that and they needed to be comfortable with communicating and and the artist, we have to understand that what that the, what they're trying to do, and to give them that window for it. Let them know, hey, this is your window for communicating. I want to hear all about it. Once I get started, it's going to be harder to make changes. So let's let's get through all the details now. Take your time. I'm yeah. all here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, black work. What attracted you to black work, and uh, the current kind of manifestation of that that you're doing, which has got some modern, almost futuristic elements combined with some very classic uh, ancient ones. It's, it's, a, it's a neat look. Yeah, I think I, I, 
I mean, Blackwood was kind of the, or I guess what was called like tribal was the first, um, was the first type of tattoo. And I ever really, I ever, you know, got into or saw or was drawn to. Um, and then, you know, kind of went through various stages of, uh, you know, of being interested in, in like color or then like, you know, more traditional or, you know, but I, I, I kind of always gravitated toward back towards that, you know, that heavier kind of tribal looking, you know, that tribal aesthetic really. Um, and it really was the, the power of it, you know, the strength of, of a design, you know, as a visual art, I just think with that, you know, the black ink with the contrast to skin, um, it, you know, for, to my eye, it just makes the most striking, striking tattoo. Um, and then there was, and then the, honestly, the history of it, the 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 background in tattooing, the the, the rich history of tattooing. Uh, it's really kind of once I really started delving into that side of it, and there was there was nothing else that I could, there was nothing else that that called to me like that for for, for me to do. In terms of like other other tattoos to look at and appreciate, yeah, all of them. But for me to you know to spend my time, you know, my day day in day out doing, you know, this was it. And again, I should emphasize as well, it, it was it wasn't just about the tattoo and the way it looked. It was about what it represented. So going back to kind of you know the name that I chose for my work, and again that kind of works in parallel with the type of work I chose to do is what it represented, what it what it means, and so. If you look kind of historically at tattoos and um, when they were, you know, when they were done or what they were part of, you know, very often they were part of a kind of a rite of passage or, a, you know, a, a marking of, of like not a mark on the body, but, you know, a marking of, 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 a, of a transition of a, you know, it could be, a, you know, there was like a passing or a, or a birth or, you know, very similar to what people get tattooed with now that, you know, they've, they've used them. Um, historically for for these sorts of things and and again that ritualistic element of it really appealed to me um you know there was a there's a guy over now I, I speak about him a bit because i i see what he does he's over in new zealand and he's kind of he's really pushing his, you know the, the kind of maori work um, really kind of reclaiming that cultural identity for, for the maori people with their tattoos and again you know i see his approach and not only, again, his work is very inspirational for me on an aesthetic level, but again, more than that, his approach and what it represents to him. And I can, you know, the weight that it carries, it's uh, it's very inspiring. Um, you know, it's one of those, you know, I look at the, the, the scale of the work and the, the amount of work he's got and, 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 and how he's really bringing these people together and, and bringing a whole culture forward. And I go, I'm like, fuck, man, what am I doing? You know, what I, you know it's kind of like, it's very humbling. So what is this artist's name? His name's uh, on Instagram. It's G Toy T O I. It's Gordon Hatfield. He had uh, he did, he had some books. I think it was like in the nineties, dedicated by Blood. I think it was, and but he's still just smashing it now. Um, you know, he's been doing this for a long time, and again, his his body of work and the scale of his work, it's yeah, it's fantastic. So what when I was first wanting to get into tattooing so this is a while ago uh, 32 years ago the the books the only, some of the only books that were out on the subject that that were easy to find were ed hardy's tattoo time books uh, uh do you have those you familiar with yeah, them uh, uh, yeah i am where they are we, like we can't it's on the other wall but it's just in book like, everything's right, right. Yeah, you know <laughs> there's books yeah, we've got one of those yeah. Ones. yeah but uh yeah the uh so New tribalism. Uh, at the time, it, that was just so groundbreaking. You know, we hadn't seen it. Anybody who had, you know, had no exposure to Islander tattooing had just not seen this stuff, right? And this is the first time I'd seen Leo Zaletta's work. And He's the man. Yes, and, and an amazing person, too. Uh, but there's a piece in, I don't know if it's in that particular one. It might actually be in the Rock and Roll Tattoos uh, edition, but... Uh, music and sea tattoos, but uh, it's a sleeve that Leo had done um, on this guy, Ron Athey. And it is just all these very bold diagonals, about one inch stripes, some straight up and down and 
bold diagonals. And, and I noticed you're doing a lot of that. I was just wondering if you're familiar with the piece, because I remember seeing that piece uh, on Ronnie yeah. and just being completely blown away. And uh, so I would say, like, I, I still look at Leo's work now. Uh, you, you know, I still look there for inspiration. It, I, he's still, for me, one of the most inspirational tattooers. You know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I can't over, overstate the impact that he's had, not only on my career, but, you know, within tattooing generally. Um, and for sure, because Leo's got a similar kind of setup on his arm as well, actually, with the kind of, right. you know, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, for sure. Um, I, the, I'd say the stuff I'm doing now with that that very like kind of linear movement, it, it's not necessarily consciously uh, consciously from there, but for sure, um, you know, everything Leo's done, I've probably seen and they've been inspired by it uh, some way, shape, or form. Um, I'm just with the, with the with the very linear stuff at the minute. I kind of a couple of years ago really started. Uh, looking at kind of a lot of calligraphy stuff and that was yes. with the with the movement of a brush i have a good friend gordo who, who does calligraphy and i spent time working with him um, i'm familiar with gordo yeah yeah okay cool um so I, I think there was elements of that came in as well um but like but, you know again it's just th th i feel like that's what my work is it's just like a melting pot of 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 different different things um you know, again, you know, yourself and the, and the kind of the biomech, uh, the biomech scene and, you know, there's guys like uh, Marcus and, you know, I'm familiar with all your guys' work. And again, it, it's, your know, biomech, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, a big, a big presence over in the UK or in Europe, I don't think. I know, like, again, there's Marcus and there's different people, but, but for me, again, it's always been something, it's like, it's super similar to to the work I do. It's just like a color three dimensional version of it, right? But it works on kind of form and structure and shapes. Um, and again, I, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, I couldn't, I would be lying if I said that I, I hadn't seen your work or Marcus's and I hadn't like taken shapes and worked with them. I, again, oh, yeah. you know, I, it's kind of. I, again, I look at a lot of a lot of things. I mean, again, and not so much. I'd say these these days, I don't look so much to tattoo in now. I'm more kind of, maybe it's like uh, fashion or architecture or, or or typography stuff like that. But what initially got the ball rolling and how it was looking at just tattoos, all tattoos, 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 and just finding my way with it. And it's like a little, you know, a, a little melting pot. Um, so yeah. Uh, for sure, Leo's work and, and that them diagonal ones that you're referring to will have had somewhere in the back there will have had a a, a play in what I'm producing now. The same way as kind of you know the stuff that I was drawn to with Gordo's work it has its play and the, and and it's interesting because just recently I've really started going back with like um, you know just sat waiting to to do some um, just sat waiting I got like byros and I just and now I feel like you know I'm just spending time with byros just just you know moving my hand on a piece of paper and now it feels like all of a sudden all the curls are coming back here like th there's a real mix now with like those lines and curls and for so for like the past maybe a couple of years it's all been very hard and straight edges with little flicks and now all of a sudden the curls are coming back in and you know it's just yeah well you know it's it's fun to do it all and you know to to reference marcus again uh he's definitely done uh a lot of both you know you'll see things he's done that you know it's funny you, you talk about tribal and bio i've heard bio referred to as transformer tribal right and especially for <laughs> marcus is more more mech stuff and you get those same angles and it's not just every angle it's a certain angle right it's kind of yeah, the same yeah. angle you're messing around with that that's 30 60 kind of yeah. thing and um and then you'll see him dive into this much more organic stuff too and and uh i think it's important to explore and and to, to find these different voices through the years to let, our, let ourselves evolve. Uh, and sometimes you feel a different whim. You know, when I draw, I try to honor my hand and I figure our hand has movements built into it. The way the hand is built, the architecture of it, the muscles, the bones, the, the preferences that it has, the movements that feel good. Uh, so when I draw, I usually start it small like within the jurisdiction of where my hand can reach without having to lift up right 
Yeah. Uh, even my back pieces start out small like that, but there are movements that come naturally to the hand. They're going to be a little bit different for each artist, right? We're going to, somebody might make an arc like this while somebody else with the same movement is going to be more inclined to do an S curve. And we're, we're yeah. all built a little differently. And so when you think about something drawn in an artist's hand, it's a literal thing. Yeah. And I think, again, that's one of the, uh, I would say that's one of the real, real key and important things about uh, drawing your stuff, you know, drawing designs. And, uh, you know, the, I think there's a, quite a lot of tattooers now that, um, you know, a lot of it can be traced, you know, there's a lot of tracing and maybe it's stenciled on or it's, uh, you know, it, it's maybe like cut and paste almost and, and done just on a computer and, and these sort of, and there's no knock on that. It's a different thing, but it's interesting because, for sure there's ways that you hand like I couldn't agree with you more because I know if I'm struggling to draw something if I'm feeling a bit flat and not very inspired um you know and I'm talking more now like on an artistic you know like if I've got a flat piece of paper in front of me and I don't know what to do there's just there's movements that my arm will start making and I just I know if I just keep doing those for a little bit then all of a sudden there'll be a glimmer of something which I can hang on to and then I start building off that and then all of a sudden, like, you know, 15, 20 minutes down the line, and I'm looking at it going, hmm, this has got legs now. There's, you know, now I'm onto something. Whereas if you'd have asked me half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, it's like, this is shit. I've got not like, what the fuck's going on here? You know, and it is really like working through that frustration or even better if I can nip it in the bud and not even find that frustration, just trust in the process. But again, there's just those movements that feel good that, that you know, and I think... You know, I think a lot of people, I think we all kind of have that. Uh, like at school, I think about how when you're bored at school, you just get a biro, right? Like, I mean, like I say, like I do there, I just had a fucking biro and I was just, you know, I was sat waiting for stuff, you know, so I just, I just start moving my hand on the paper with, with a biro. It's, um, I think most kids did that at school. You know, you just, if you're bored, you start doodling. Um, there's, there's something in that. There's some, there's some therapy there. Yeah. Yeah. My doodles were a lot more deliberate, uh, this is a spaceship. Uh, and they got me in trouble, <laughs> usually. Uh, so uh, not to divert too far off of our, our subject here, but uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the intersection of tattooing and the mixed martial arts world, since this is one of your uh, subjects of interest. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, you're talking well, about power totems and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, MMA fighters, they'll, they'll often get these tattoos that have very bold, you know, very, you know, of course, I think athletes, when they get tattooed, they do better when they get things that are very strong, simple, bold, look good from a distance. Uh, but of course, they also want to have personal significance. But, you know, you get a guy like Dennis Rodman who covers himself with pieces that up close might look really good, but from a distance, it doesn't look like much, right? Uh, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? When you see like in, in the UK, like, you know, football's big, like, or soccer. And, um, and it's crazy, but it's like, it's almost a standing joke. It's just generally how, how bad, you know, like, you know, these guys got all the money in the world. They got, you know, and, and it's still, it's like, it, yeah, it's crazy. They do, you know what it often. is? From, from what I understand, uh, you know, my sister uh, used to hang out with this sports writer guy and, uh, these athletes, they often will end up very cloistered, okay? They're not mixing with the public very much, uh, except in very structured settings. And uh, they mix with a lot of other athletes. And they often, just like a rock band, end up with some guy on the fucking tour bus that <laughs> tattoos. And yeah, this is the right. same reason why you've got so many really top-level musicians in the same boat with, yeah. like... Eh, kind of tattoos it's like come on you can just get on the internet and start searching and in 10 minutes you'll find way better stuff than that look up the name find their studio oh, yeah our tour hits that in four weeks okay i'll look them up yeah. and yeah damn straight most of them are going to make time for you but no that's yeah. not what happens no i know it's crazy i can never get my i can't get my head around that yeah i can't get well, my head around it it's a different world. I mean, that's what I try to remind myself. It's just a different world. Like, you know, there might be things that are obvious to other people that we tattooers would never get. In fact, I'm sure there's yeah. plenty. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, so the MMA thing. Um, so like, you know, martial arts has been a, it's been a kind of, 
like a, a foundation or a building block in in my you know my personality and who I am today. Um, it was the first thing I I did that was mine, if that makes sense. Like it was something that I wanted to do. No, there was no pressure to do it. There was no no expectation and nothing like that. It was just I wanted to do that. that How that, old were you? That, oh, I was pretty young. Um, can't remember, but yeah, maybe. Maybe my dad finally took me when I was like, I'm going to say like nine or something. Okay. I think that something like that. Um, and again, and, and the desire to like, that was probably a, a year or two of me nagging him uh, to take me. So it was, it was probably somewhere around there. Um, and, and, you know, like that was, uh, that was something that was for me. Like I, there was no expectation. There was nothing like that. I just, I wanted to do that. And, uh, and it's, it's one of those things, it's, I, I don't know, like, I don't train like I use, I mean, I don't train at all like I used to. It's, you know, it's not a full-time thing for me anymore. It's something I, I do as and when, and I do it for enjoyment and to try and stay somewhat healthy and fit. Um, but it will always be, uh, I feel like it'll always be a huge part of my life. It was, it was so kind of instrumental in, in helping me grow and, and, and move into myself. Uh, but it's interesting because when I kind of decided, like, actually, this isn't, I'm not going to do this anymore. It was a very difficult, I find it very hard to step away and not be that person and not, that, that not be part of my identity, someone that, that competes on a regular basis. Um, but it's also, it also, it also taught me a lot about, it taught me that I was, I was a lot more than, than just what I, than just being that guy. Uh, and it's the same now, you know, it, it's interesting, but I kind of, it works with tattooing for me now. Like I, it's very easy with tattoo or anything really, if you're into it, but you know, for me, it's very easy for me to get wrapped up in tattooing and, and not really see anything outside of it. Um, and then every now and then I, you know, I remind myself, I see, you know, see the pictures up on there and it's like, yeah, I used to, I had another life at one point, like that was, you know, tattooing was a, was a back of the mind thing, or it was a, you know, it, there are times when things happen and, and that time's passed and now th this is the time for this. But, you know, I, I as I feel now, I think I, I want to have longevity with tattooing and I want to be doing it until I'm in my 60s or something. But that being said, I've already gone through one cycle of something and found another. And if, and if you know, five years from now, it was no longer serving, serving me, you know, as in it no longer brought fulfillment into my life or it wasn't viable anymore, then I'd go through, you know, I, I know that I can go through that transition and, uh, you know, and kind of, I, I don't anchor my identity too heavily onto just a thing, uh, you know, which is, again, it's easy to do when you're younger. And like I say, what I did with martial arts, I think that's why you see these, you know, you see youth cultures because you want to belong and you, and you want to know who you are and where you fit in the world. And that's a lot easier to do when you've got a, when you've got kind of a bedrock that you can build upon. Whereas now, you know, tattooing is just a, it, you know, it's, I mean, it's a huge part of my life, but, you know, I'm also a father, uh, you know, I'm also a partner to Joe, I also have my parents and brother and sister, I've got friends, I, you know, I've got other hobbies that I like to, to do, I, uh, you know, it's part of, it's part of something, it's part of me. It's just, it's something um, you do. It's not me. Right, yeah. yeah. You know what, I think that parenting teaches you that more than anything else. You know, anything that you thought was your identity before that, uh, parts of it almost become laughable. You know, yeah. uh, you think that was important? I actually thought that was important. <laughs> it's like, I have a choice between doing that and sleeping. I'm gonna sleep, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, uh, that comes up a lot, you know? Um, but just in terms of the fulfillment that you get from things and knowing that you're doing something that's that's got depth, that's got lasting importance. I mean, we all wanna do something with lasting importance. Um, and I think as artists, we kind of go back and forth between this idea of uh, I want to immortalize myself as an artist or I want to influence people or, or be part of something bigger. And yet at the same time, sometimes you just want to make art and enjoy it and not worry about those things. You know, I remember an art teacher once tell telling the class, uh, while you're working on your project, remember, you're not painting this for the museum. Right. Uh, 
don't think about like later on uh, uh, during your exhibition, here's the, the, some of the early works. It's, no, you, you're not, you don't want to think of yourself that way. Yeah. You want to enjoy yeah. the moment. You want to actually recognize when you're having a perfect moment. This, is, this has been something I've been trying to do a lot in 2020 because yeah. there's a surprising number of them. Constantly they're happening. You know, and if you don't recognize that they just flutter away, but it could just be you're, you're seeing your child, the lighting is amazing, there's a good feeling in your stomach, you've got a hot tea, uh, and you don't have to be anywhere right now. And it could be as yeah. simple as that. Uh, perfect moments don't, don't call for that much other than just the ability to recognize them. Do you not think as well, though, and I agree completely there, and again, lockdown, you know, has definitely brought that about for me. And, and I think part of the problem with with the way a lot of things are now is that we all think it should be epic right we think like it should be fucking like so yeah you're right like the light comes through nicely your kids there you've got a hot cup of tea but wait there there's not the fucking music and there's not the fireworks in the sky and there's not the you know you're missing all the epic bit and then you you strip it all down you realize that's that shit doesn't need, well one it doesn't exist and two that wasn't that was never the important stuff that was the garnish you know it's like you know the, the the real stuff is what you said there you strip it down and that's it it's just being there with your kid it's how, you know it's it's being grateful that you've got a, you, you've got a cup let alone a cup filled with hot tea that you enjoy drinking you know it's it's um yeah i really that's it right there and uh and i think getting wrapped up and i i can say i've definitely been guilty of this um being wrapped up in my in my ego where you know it used to be a big thing for me the, the word I used to like was legacy. I wanted to leave a legacy. You know, I wanted, I wanted to leave a body of work that was, you know, big pieces and over lots of people and da, da, da. And it was, again, it was that I really wanted to leave a legacy. I, I'll level with you now. As I feel right now, that shit just doesn't really matter to me. I'm not, I'm honestly not bothered. Um, you know, when I die, you just burn it, burn over every picture I've ever done. Ever, I, I'm not bothered. Um, I, so long as I provide the experience and the tattoo that my client, uh, uh, whatever they expect, I hope I can exceed it. Even if it's just by a little bit, I hope I just exceed what was expected of me that day. And if I can do that, then, then by the end of it all, I can just die a happy man. And I'm not, I'm not worried about a legacy. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 I've done it. I've, I've felt that before. I've put untold amount of pressure on myself. I've worked myself into a into a, a, sh a shit headspace. You know, I've had a like complete meltdown with it and just, you know, and I'm and I'm a better tattooer today and a better artist today and a better dad today and a better person today for having gone through all that and realizing that for me, like maybe some people it serves them to just go, I want this legacy, I want to be, I'm gonna be completely wrapped up and and this is it. For me, I'm, I'm better the other. I'm better to just go. You know that stuff isn't actually that important. Like I thought it was for a minute, but now I realise I was only ever I was only really doing that because it was like a an ego fueled thing. Like I wanted I wanted other people to see. That's for other people, right? Your legacy. It's not for you. It's for other people. It's for other people to to see that, and you know, and and, and then it feels good. They clap you on the back, this that, the other. But no. Well, and they I'm, also I'm, keep they also keep con contacting you for work. So there is that side of it. But I hear you. The for sure best hey, feeling, the very best is. feeling when and your I, client looks at the piece at the end of the day and says this is better than i expected you know how that feels yeah. right it's awesome yep that, so, that look when, you, when they go to the mirror when they go to the mirror and see it for the first time and you and you like see i'm always like as soon as like i'm just gonna say the mirror is there so as soon as we finish i take my gloves i'll come around the side and i go and stand behind them and watch them watch themselves in the mirror so i can do the same thing oh yeah, yeah. yeah there's that look there it is um yeah. So yeah, that you know that. But like I say, that, that's it. And and like I say, and ho and hopefully I can, hopefully I can deliver a, a good a good experience for them, where they'll tell people about how good it was. They'll share what I'm doing, and then ha have faith in in my in my work, in my craftsman, you know, my my ability to execute uh, and design and visualize a piece that is interesting enough for people, so that when I put it out there, more people come in. Um, and you know, let's let's not rule out epic entirely. There's room for epic, right? Yeah. Every now and then, you're going to do that giant painting or that mural, or you're going to have uh, the big collaborative project with three other like well-known artists doing this big thing. And and there's nothing wrong with that. And yeah. I've had I've had years like last year. Every month, I had a couple big collaborations. Uh, but you know, it wasn't like lots of live video and everything. I quickly got tired of chasing that. 
and I wanted to be in the experience because I was enjoying it so much. These are my friends coming to travel and, and get the tattoos and, and the clients getting them are really incredible people that, that you know, are submitting to this multiple artists at once thing. And, and uh, so it's epic, but it's on a different level, right? Uh, it's the less you care about how it all looks. Um, hang on. I'm going to, somebody was just trying to call me. Uh, okay. And hopefully it wasn't the flooring guy. Uh, but yeah, the less you care about how it looks to everybody else, I think the more you can enjoy it. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. The more real it is to you, the less, you know what I mean? It's like people get so caught up in how, how good other people look on social media. It's like, oh man, look how perfect their life is. My life isn't that perfect. Yeah. You know, and uh, no, those people that have those perfect looking lives, they just are putting more effort into their presentation. That's all. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't go so far as to call it a lie, but it's certainly not the whole picture. And uh, perfect lives don't exist. Uh, there's room for epic, but you really have to make time for it. And uh, you can't do it too often or you burn yourself out and uh, you don't have the, the chance to immerse yourself in the everyday, those important things, those truly important things that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And again, I agree with like, there's times to, I mean, there's, there's something called like regression to the mean, which, so for me, my, an important thing for me is like, I, I try and have a really high average. That's, that's, you know, my, is to have a really high average. Um, it was in a book. I can't think of the, the author's name now. It's like thinking, fasting and slow. It's a psychology book from like a few years ago, well, 10 years ago. Um, and he, he spoke about it. He, he went into discuss like uh, flying planes and, um, and what the, the the, the philosophy he came up with was called regression to the mean. And what he was saying is like, people have their average. And what happens is if they elevate their average, it, what they'll go up, they'll peak up here. I'm oh, sorry. Up, you know, they'll, they'll elevate up. Uh, you can then praise them. It doesn't mean they'll stay there. They'll still regress to the mean. And the same, if someone has a bad day and they're down here, you can shout at them and tell them to up their game. It won't make any difference. They'll go up anyway because they'll go to their average. And so I think it's really, for me, my, I really focus on having a high average. My output, uh, like I never come into the studio and think I'm just going to make the numbers up today. I'll fucking try and smash it out the park every day because I want my average to be high because I know that some days I'm going to I'm gonna go way above my average and I know I'll have to regress back down to the mean. But each time I feel like it ups my game a little bit more. Does that make sense? So yeah. for sure, I, I definitely... There's space for epic um, in terms of like your work and, and what you're doing. Like, like I feel like that. I feel like I have epic projects on the go and they, they challenge me and they push me and they help me uh, drive my work up. Um, but again, I don't try and get, I don't let myself get caught up and, and, and dragged away with that. You know, I focus on, you know, on, on having my, like my high average and, and make sure every day, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to up that. Um, yeah. And also, if you keep your average high, if you have a low day, it's not too low. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Those will happen. Those will happen. Yeah. You're, you're going to, you know, wake up with low energy. You had a bad night's sleep. Uh, you know, the, the drawing process just didn't connect as well. Uh, this happens to everybody. And so if, if you're used to pushing yourself really hard and you have a below average day, you want your below average to still be above average. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. But you know, that's that's a that's a tough one, and I think I think a lot of people who are, especially up and coming tattooers, uh, you know, they encounter these struggles. You know, that there's, you know, we we touched on this a little bit earlier, where you know you're talking about just sitting there and and letting the hand flow and and waiting for it to connect and actually start to to grow some legs, right? And uh, so there, there's a there's a kind of an alchemy going on there, and depending on the kind of day you're having, you're going to be more open to seeing things, grabbing onto them, and exploring, or you might just be waiting for something that's better than is going to arise on its own, and you know it's just not going to come right because uh, you're still just at that sort of random scribbling level, and and it's going to take some push to get it up and out of there, and so that push. 
right? It's, I think some people will, will recognize it as uh, an obstacle or a difficulty while others will recognize it as an inevitable part of the process. Just like if I wanna take a bike ride around the neighborhood, I have to first push the bike up our steep driveway, right? And I'm not gonna be like, oh man, this sucks. I'm like, okay, here, this is the push. I knew this push is coming. And same with like every project. And I, you know, I even had a little, a, a mantra for this that, that I came up a long time ago. Uh, every project is a hill and every hill has a hump, right? And so you're gonna find yourself at some point, kind of two thirds-ish of the way along, where, man, it was looking better before. <laughs> or, man, this is taking forever. Or, you know, I wish I had done that a little differently because now since I did that there, I have to do it all the way through, and oh, man. And then this little light bulb will go off and be like, ah, there it is, the hump, okay? Yeah. I know it's coming. And so when it arrives, I'm not like, oh shit, this is, I'm, I've encountered difficulty. I'm like, oh, here's the hump. Yeah. I know it's coming. Just like, you know, the skier knows when they get to the bottom of the hill, they have to get back on the ski lift to go back up. You know, uh, if it, you know it's coming, you know it's part of the, the landscape of making this particular art project and you say, oh, here it is. Then you're not going to be distressed by the idea of, oh man, I just fucked this thing up. You just recognize yeah. it from where it is and you keep pushing because if it was a bike ride and you encountered a hill, if you just gave up, well, you know, you're just going to sit there at the side of the road. So, yeah, recognizing that hump for what it is and knowing it's coming and saying, oh, yeah, the hump and just pushing to it. Uh, I can't tell you how important that is. And you know what? And if you can learn to love the hump, then it's fucking even better. That's even it, like, better. The, str right. the struggle. If you can get, you know, you can get to the point where you're like, oh, cool, this is where it gets difficult. I'm going to start digging in now. I'm going to start yes. digging deep on this, but you know, and I'm going to, you know, then that's when you can really start, you can really start pushing through stuff. And that's hard to embrace, you know, and being a person who's done intense physical training, I'm sure you could see the analogy, uh, you know, to take on something that you know is difficult, that you know is going to be a push to enjoy it, to psych yourself up for it and actually enjoy it and to be able to enjoy the rewards from it. Uh, that's a particular mindset and it's interesting, but I think that comparing it between athletics and art is, is a very apt comparison. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, I, I, I think everything like that's kind of interchangeable with, you know, like, <clears throat> I, I don't really see big differences between people to people and, and this person's got this physical attribute or this kind of this way of thinking or this but but ultimately like what gets them there or how, what makes them tick or how they get past them them hurdles it's really all there right it's like it's people's approach it's how they you know i think that's why that's why people love reading autobiographies and stuff like that is because because you you know you read all about because you realize everyone goes through the struggle everyone has to find their way you know get you know they either have to go over it around it or through it you know that's it to get the other side um and so you know you realize that and, and what what we look at with those people is it's kind of irrelevant what what the what the hill was what the humble what, what it was the fact is is that we just want to know did they make it did they get through it and if they did which obviously they did because they're writing the book um how did they get through it what was their what was their thought process on it and what what gave them the uh, the ability to push through uh, and i think that's kind of interchangeable for everyone in every field of something like what at some point you meet resistance and then it's like how do you deal with that um you know with grace hopefully yeah right yeah yeah and and i i think again that's uh for me that's where those like kind of mantras come in like you say you, you had the one for your artwork like i have the same with, with those things is just it's almost, and for me, it's almost like, it's just trying to trick yourself. When I say like, you know, it, it's hard, it's not enjoyable. It's like, how can I get myself to, how can I get myself to, in, to embrace this now, to enjoy this? It's like, you know, and I start just kind of feeding myself the, the, the lines in my head that will allow me to, yeah, to, to get through that. Um, I have one when I'm drawing on, like you say, if I'm, if I'm struggling and I, you know, and I'm drawing and it's not working, it's not working, you know, and it's, and again, I don't, it doesn't affect me like it used to, you know, it used to be like, I'd go downstairs and be like, Oh my God, I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. 
Um, whereas now it's, you know, it's a lot more tame, but you know, I just keep going through and I just keep telling myself, trust the process, trust the process, trust the, pro you know, I just keep going, keep going. And then, and then like I said, all of a sudden, ah, there it is. That, 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 right now I've got, now I've got my start point. And it's crazy because sometimes I can spend two hours just drawing on someone and I haven't even got my start point yet. And it's like, oh, this could be embarrassing, but luckily they don't know what's, they don't know I haven't found it yet. So I'm just like, oh, you know, but, but I just keep going through it, keep going through it, keep going through it. And then like I said, at some point, it, it clicks and you go, oh, okay, now I know where I'm at. You know, so do, you ever, uh, do you ever get photos of your client ahead of time and draw on those photos? Um, yeah, okay, so I ask people to send uh, a photo of themselves in a natural position from various angles so I can have a look. Um, yes, I will do that, um, but that's only ever for me to, that's only ever for me. Uh, I don't show them to the clients. Um, uh, I, I used to, um, but what I found happened is they would, I couldn't get a certain bit to work that I thought would work and it's just not going to work because, you know, I've gone from a flat piece of paper to a, a kind of a 3D undulating arm or whatever. Right. And it's, that shape's just not going to work there. It's, it looks great on a flat piece of paper. And trying to explain that to someone is like, yeah, I know that looks good there, but it, it looks shit when I draw it on. Trust me, it's not going to work. You know, and it, and then I feel like they got caught, they got hung up on the, the, on the drawing I've done on paper. They really like that now and they want that. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't do that because that's not going to work. And now I feel like they they they're not going to be happy with what I draw because they've got this they've got an unrealistic expectation now. Um, and even if I like I feel like I I always draw better on the skin. Like my drawings are always better once they're on the body as opposed to what I can draw on paper. Um, but it doesn't again it, like it's not just good enough for me to say I'm happy with that. I need my client to be like I fucking love that. That's awesome. Otherwise we don't do it. Um, you know so. So it's, yeah, I don't do the whole like, okay, here's the design. What do you think? And, and I, I get it. It's, it's, it's an interesting approach because I do ask a lot of trust from people. You know, you have to turn up and, and you are, you need to be able to hand over and, and trust that I'm going to, that I know what I'm doing and that I can, I'm capable of, of achieving what it is you expect. Um, but again, I feel like that's the kind of, that's the kind of benefit of, of having, uh, you know, been tattooed for a long time and, and kind of having a body of work, I should, you know, having a, a large body of work that shows what you're capable of. Uh, you know, I'm not showing like computer mock-ups or, or, or whatnot. It's like, these are, you know, these are tattoos that I've done. You can see here, this is the, the style of work. This is the, uh, this is the kind of um, the quality that you can expect and the finished product, you know, it's, and again, and I share a lot of stuff that uh, you scroll now, I share a lot of my uh, in progress works. I like, I really like people to see that, that uh, everything I do is free handed on. It's drawn directly onto the skin. And um, because I do feel that, I, you know, I don't know if, if when I say I feel proud of that is it's a bit strong maybe, but it's something that I certainly think has value. Uh, the, the ability to draw a design directly onto the skin that, you know, it took a, took a long time to really be comfortable in that process. Uh, you know, to just have someone stood there and drawn on them. And like we, we, we referenced before, you know, I, I do feel like from the years of doing it, my arm has a, a natural movement and I have designs that I can see and feel as I'm doing them. Um, you know, I think that's a, it's a really important aspect of the work I produce. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm also a mostly freehand artist and I get that. Uh, the reason I was asking about the, the photos of, of the body part is uh, for the kind of tattooing I'm doing, I find that I just have an easier time starting the drawing or, or doing those initial scribbles and, and finding a connection when I can see, ah, there's this cut right here, uh, this bulge right here, this crazy vein over here. And yeah. uh, so what I've been doing since, I've really only just started doing, using Procreate in this last year. I'm, I'm very analog still in, in, in many ways. Uh, I've been using Photoshop for over 20 years, but uh, uh, the idea of my first drawings, you know, my initial thumbnails being digital is just something I'm still very early on and getting comfortable with. But uh, I like the fact that I can knock out six or seven five minute quickie sketches uh, without getting attached to them. I can shrink them down small and okay, I'm going to doodle on it while it's only two inches tall and I'm going to you know, blow it up a little bit more and, and go a little farther and okay, well, that's, that's five minutes worth. There's some good stuff here. All right. I'm going to blank that layer and look at the next one. And, and uh, so I'll have five or six and sometimes 
I'll even show them to the client. And I will say, you know, these first three, uh, I really like all of them. The other three, you know, those are kind of my warm ups. There's some cool parts in them, but I'm just curious to hear your comments. So I'll keep it kind of open like that. And yeah. if they say, yeah, number two, I fucking love number two. Well, then if I have equal feelings about the first three, but they fucking love number two, I'm going to roll with number two, right? Uh, I'm not going to let them steer me towards a decision that I think would, would be, you know, a bad design. Uh, but at the same time, I think that there is value in me showing them the sketches at that early stage, right? Now, yeah. from there, I may go on to doing a much more detailed uh, shaded sketch, in which case uh, I'm going to be a little bit less open at that point. You know, like we were saying earlier, uh, there's a time and a place in the consultation process. But, you know, my clients are almost too open to things sometimes. So I have the opposite problem where uh, yeah. they're like, yeah, bro, just do whatever you want. And I'm like, well, I do all kinds of stuff. And I know that there's probably some work I've done that you like more than others. So at least tell me that, <laughs> and you know, give me yeah. some basis. Uh, because honestly, I actually love being thrown on curveballs as long as it's early in the process, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, people asking me to do something a little unexpected. Uh, I love that because I wouldn't ask myself to do that. I just don't want them to hit me with that one. You know, I'm almost done with the drawing or whatever I've got. And we've talked about it enough that I've got a clear vision in my head that I'm already feeling really good about. Uh, yeah. I don't want a curveball then, but early yeah. on in the process, I'm all about it. I, uh, I think, I think it's healthy. You know, guys, but, um, my work definitely evolved and has changed and has become what it is uh, based on, or, in part and in thanks to doing heavy cover-ups and doing blast overs. And again, it's like, if you, if someone comes to me, they're like, I've got this and I want to cover it. I don't mind that because now I've got parameters to work within. And that's like a curveball for me. Cause it's like all of a sudden, well, I would have done it like this, 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 but I can't do that now because you want to cover it. So now I've got to, now I've got to come up with a different solution that wouldn't have been my go-to. Okay, so let's see where this goes now. And, and, and similar to you, like I asked for people to send me a picture of themselves and then I asked them to send me any of my work that, that, that particularly they particularly resonate with to give me a start point. Um, you know, so once I kind of get that, um, yeah, once I get that point of reference to, to, where to where to begin, then I can start moving off there. But again, it, it's like, yeah, you throw a big tie in there that you need covering or you, that's definitely evolved my work more than if I you know, if I hadn't have had something to cover. Um, so yeah, I completely get that, you know, the, the curveball where it forces you to think different to what your normal working parameters would be. Um, yeah, you get a weird shape with a strange placement. It's like, okay, um, yeah. if I cover this the right way and make it into something that flows with the arm, but still embraces some of the weird, I'm gonna come up with something truly different. Yeah, I got to start a back piece last month where we had cover-ups on both shoulder blades and one side is a tribal cover up. And I just absolutely love what that forced the piece into. Uh, it ended up creating this, the, the, these four kind of dark vignettes that had this great curling shape to them because I wanted to work with some of the negative space in that, right? And uh, as far as being a biomech back piece, it just gave it such a structure, you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, man, I'm all about the cover ups. Uh, so can I, can I just flip this on its head for a little minute? Yeah. Can I just, can I ask you some questions? Is this cool? Cause I'm just, I'm really interested in what, what you've just said there is uh, so when you, so you design and you, you have an idea and then you put on and then you draw on predominantly freehand onto the body. Um, so when you're, when you're doing that, draw, okay. Do you have multiple color pens that you go through? Like you have a, like a, a green and orange or something yes. like this? Or, yes. Yeah. Usually there, there'll be three levels. I do a fair amount of uh, blending and shading uh, because with, your pens. with the pens, because I yeah. want to kind of map out my gradients uh, in the, okay. in the drawing page. Uh, and I occasionally I'll post some of these drawings. I notice other biomech artists do this too. Jesse Levitt does a bit of that as well. Of, uh, so you know where your pause and egg relationships are going to be and you know what directions your gradients are running. Cause I'm not just going in there and outlining. I actually start with a magma and just, shade the whole really? thing uh, unless there's something really precise in there in which case i'll pop on a liner but uh 
yeah, a lot of it is uh, very backwards tattooing. And I find it's really helpful for me to know my pas neg and my gradients at the beginning. So you line at the end more so to sharpen bits up, would you? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then so when when you're designing this, so you've got your, your thumbnail, and then you're and you're looking at the back, and you're drawing, you're getting your gradients in. As you're visualizing it, is it? Uh, how does it work? Like, do you, right? So you see this shape coming in here. Like, is that a, like is that a very obvious shape? Like, this is going to be really dark. This is going to be light, but there's going to be gradients through this light. Like, so do you see it two dimensional? Uh, like, as a as a as a basic shape, or do you do you see it from the get go? Is like, right, this is having a really like three dimensional view kind of straight out the gate well uh i'm, I'm sorry there's the roof and the flooring guy keeps trying to call me um, okay. yeah you know the 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 act of visualiz uh, visualization you know you get a flash in your head of seeing something but i think that you know it's not like like you got a computer generating it in your head, right? It's yeah. It's more like you get a sense of what it's going to look like and kind of a list of the procedures of what you're going to do to get it there. You know, there's this, like, what is the whole artistic process going to be and what is the end result going to look like? The, the vision is, is complex like that, right? And, yeah. uh, and you don't get to truly see the piece until you've actually done it. Well, right? It's not until a rendered image, then, right? It's like the magnetic pull towards the piece right and you yeah. sense it and you're doing everything towards it but you know for example let's say you've got a big spike and i'm going to ask myself okay how how do i want to handle my gradients behind this thing and in it in order to you know am i going to have pause neg relationship uh, or a neg, a neg on pause how am i going to make it float am i going to have a cast shadow and so I'll, I'll have the the kind of the logic of it planned out and i'll move through the procedure and, uh, and I'll try to follow my gut as I'm shading it. Um, and there's kind of a math mathematical process to shading, right? You know, imagining the light is coming from this direction and here's a bump. And so the shading is gonna go exactly here. Uh, and the more you do this sort of thing, the more exact you can kind of get with those algorithms, so to speak. But uh, again, you don't really get to see it until it's all the way done. Uh, this is one of the reasons why when I do my thumbnails, I shade them. I don't just do line drawings. And when I'm happy with a thumbnail, I feel like I'm ready to freehand it on the person with marker. And I'll just try to take what's in my thumbnail and reproduce it on them, but it's always going to change, right? And, and you know how it is because the thumbnail is flat, right? And whether I've drawn it on the photo of their body or just in a sketchbook page, once it wraps and connects around the inside of the arm or whatever it's doing, all kinds of things are going to come up that, that you didn't expect. And so there's always going to be those differences. Uh, but, you know, I'm trying to carry that vision along, first of all, by having the shaded thumbnail and then the shaded freehand marker drawing where you can stand back and look at it across the room. You can always already see how the darks and lights are going to work. And I take a photo of it and I go have lunch and look at the photo and come back and inevitably change some stuff because uh, I've just learned to need that, you know? Um, and I almost always end up looking at the photo and saying, okay, what shape's going to make it bigger? And I'll try to come back and erase some things and clarify, simplify, and make a couple things bigger. And then I'll move through the, the Magnum first procedure. So by the time the person leaves uh, after their first visit, you know, I've carried that vision the whole way, you know, the, the shaded vision that I came up with on that sketchbook page, they've got that far. It's rough. It's a roughly shaded in version of it, but uh, the, the depth is already starting to take shape. Um, you know, I haven't reduced it too much. You know, I haven't taken this really complex thing and reduce it down to a line drawing and then put this yeah. stencil on them and then a, a gray line or whatever and then having to translate that gray line back up into a shaded vision. I've, I've tried to carry the whole, sh the shaded vision of it all the way from the sketchbook page directly onto their skin. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's uh, really interesting, yeah. So yeah. thinking like yeah, a painter that's... a lot. I think painting uh, and, and doing a lot of, uh, you know, looser work, uh, which I have been more inclined towards, uh, you know, as I've been painting and working with bigger brushes, um, I think that 
uh, it's caused me to become more organic with my uh, tattooing process. So it's a lot more like painting. Uh, but at the same time, there's many things about the process that have become much more exact through the years. There's some things I'll still experiment with. Do I do this before this, you know, but a lot of the time I'll just, I've got a kind of a vision in my head and I've got my sketch and I'm just going to throw myself at it and keep working until it's there. I'll, I'll change the needle group 15 times before I'm done with the first pass sometimes yeah. uh, if the piece calls for it. And I, I know how I want it to look, even though I can't see that finished vision, I know how I want it to look. And I can get yeah. specific enough to say, okay, this shape here, I'm not gonna go darker than 60% with any of the details because I really want it to rise from the background. Consequently, the background behind it, I'm gonna go really dark and not have any light details. Uh, you know, so I can say all that stuff to myself. I've got those lists and words in my mind. But again, to see the whole thing, I just have to finish it. So yeah, I feel this, like people often ask me like, oh, you know, have you got a clear vision of how this is going to look when it's done? I'm like, I honestly don't have a clue. Like, I mean, in theory, I obviously know all the bits that are going to be black and, uh, you know, and I, I've got, I know what my ratio is of skin to ink and all these things. But uh, I, never, I don't really like, I don't know where it's, I don't have like a super rendered image in my mind of how that's going to be. It's kind of, it, I'm only going to know what it really looks like once it's done. And it's that thing of, again, of like trust in the process, like all the experience you've got, all the tattoos you've got behind you, they give you that, that kind of depth of knowledge, right? Cause you've learned, right? This bit, this does work and, oh wait, and then this doesn't work. And over the years, you kind of, you get that, that, uh, you know, you get your, your skill set, if you like your vision, your skill set, your approach, so that, so that you know that even if you don't know exactly how it's going to look, you know, it's going to work, you know, it's going to be a successful tattoo, you know, like you say, you're not taking it and then kind of simplifying something that's got all these gradients down to a, a line drawing and then trying to kind of retranslate that back. I mean, that makes sense to me how that would, it, there's too many steps in that now. And each time you take a step, you're going to lose something of what could be sort of thing. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I definitely, and it, yeah, it's fascinating to hear how you do that, your approach on that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing with that first vision is knowing how you want it to look is one thing. Uh, but, you know, I'm imagining the client's perspective. There's also the question of how you want it to feel, right? What the tattoo is supposed to project, you know, does that person want to project strength and power? Do they want to project, uh, uh, you know, natural beauty, do they want to project protection? You know, there's so many different things and you could draw the same tattoo three different ways with that intent in your mind. And, and there'll be subtle things about it that are going to be different each way. Uh, and so the intent behind it, I think, you know, like um, I got to do this kind of fiery lava mech uh, back piece with this, uh, this other artist, Killian Moon earlier in this year, and, and I remember when we were working on it, uh, really feeling like um, I was trying to imagine fire and heat while I was actually working on the piece, while the shading was going down. And just having that in my mind, I think made it possible for me to, uh, you know, render it the right way. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I haven't sat and done tons of studies of heat and fire, but I think having it in your mind, having that intent of how you want something to feel will allow you to tap into your deep well of, of, uh, of tricks and also to just have that in, in your, your mind and in your, and, and in your spirit as you're doing the art because it translates through. I, I think your intent is, is impossible to mask when you make your art. That's, that's when it's the clearest and, uh, so if, if we know what our client wants and we put that into our intent while we're doing the piece, uh, we're, we're going to be a lot closer to being able to honor what their needs are. You know, that's such a, it's such a big thing for me that, that the, the intention with something is far more important than the, uh, than the, than the end kind of outcome almost, because I feel like, you know, we were saying before, you can have a great tattoo, um, objectively, but if you know if the person doing it didn't get a good experience, or sorry, getting it didn't get a good experience or whatnot, then it's a uh, kind of they never feel good with it. 
I think you can have, you know, again, I know people who have got technically poor tattoo or not poor, but, you know, average tattoos in there, but they love them because the intention for it was all good. It was done, you know, with good intent, with, you know, with positivity. And I think that they carry that. I think, yeah, you know, again, you can't overstate the importance of just having, you know, d- doing something for the right reason. You know, things don't tend to go too far wrong when you do something for the right reason. I think that that is something you could probably put on your headstone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, words to live by. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, I uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, tattooing gives us all something to be really grateful for. And uh, it's easy to forget that sometimes. Hey, I just got to wrap up this Zoom meeting here real quick. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can't tell you how glad I am to, to be not just practicing this art form, but part of this community. Uh, it's, it's easy to forget sometimes because, every, you know, the day-to-day drag of things is, uh, I think it's easy to get caught up in and the things that we have to give up and people not wearing, wanting to wear masks or, or take new precautions or, or uh, you know, have the party atmosphere in the shop. And, you know, like tattooing feels like it's been shit on a little bit this year. But at the same time, there's so many things to be grateful for. And, and uh, I still wouldn't want any other, any other career. Uh, no. 32 years in, it's, uh, it's not just about the work. It's about the people. And yeah. uh, the longer I do this, the more I realize that uh, they give something back that uh, I couldn't get any other way. And, and uh, um, you know, it's, it's nice to put food on the table, but uh, the growth that... Uh, this art form is offered has is, is something I don't think I could have personally found anywhere else. Yeah, I think, yeah. So real quick, uh, while we have a little bit more time left, uh, we've got some comments. Uh, Melissa Sink says, uh, this is very inspiring little nuggets in all of these interviews. Uh, Euro Tattoo Robert says, uh, learning new stuff, the hump, uh, great takeaway, talking about uh, getting through the hump. Uh, it. Uh, next tattoo six eighty two says this is awesome. Guy is so slick with the transition of questions. Uh, Tivan says this is all really great stuff. Thanks to the both of yous. Uh, the underground says I'm actually glad my appointment no showed so I could watch this. Thanks. And then there's a whole nother round of people that were on Facebook and all the other places. But uh, just wanted to uh, let you know what some of the folks were, uh, were thinking. Right on. Well, thanks for everyone uh, who tuned in today. And for your comments, this will be available for re, uh, reviewing. Uh, it'll probably get posted today or tomorrow. And uh, we'll be doing more stuff here on the Reinventing Live channel. Thank you again, Mr. Hanumantra, for joining awesome. us today. It's been awesome. Thank really you for taking talk. the time, Guy. Keep up the great work, man. You too. Have a good one.